Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Earth and Environmental Science and Module 1 Earth Resources. This is video number 5 and our continuing mini-series on looking at the structure of the Earth and in this video specifically the mantle and the asthenosphere. So our learning goal is to, uh, or at least is to try and encourage you to be able to describe the compositional layers and thicknesses of the Earth's layers including the asthenosphere. So we're going to focus a little bit more on the asthenosphere and its uh, nature, its composition and some of its properties in relation to the rest of the mantle. So what you should be able to do is to identi uh, identify the asthenosphere, so whether that's from a map or from a freehand drawing or just through a written description. Then we want you to extend that description to include some understanding of the composition of the asthenosphere and then perhaps to contrast different regions of the asthenosphere and uh, the rest of the mantle by providing some persuasive evidence. So firstly, what is the asthenosphere? Well, the asthenosphere is the upper layer of the Earth's mantle. Now, it's not the very top layer. Remember that we've already talked about the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is, this, is the solid material on the surface of the Earth. And that includes all of the crust, but it also includes the um, upper part of the mantle. Now, one of the problems with the mantle is the mantle is, is so thick that it has uh, several different defined layers. So we're still in the upper part of the mantle. When we're talking about the asthenosphere, we're just not at the top of the mantle. So we have a lithosphere, then underneath the lithosphere, we have the asthenosphere. And that is the layer, asthenosphere, and that's the layer that we're going to be looking at in this particular video. It sits above the, the well, the kind of boundary between the upper part and the lower part of the mantle and obviously above the uh, outer and inner core, but sitting below the lithosphere. It has a relatively low resistance to plastic flow, so it's a little bit more capable of uh, fluid motion than uh, certainly the solid lithosphere. And this is very important when we're looking at um, things like plate tectonics. So one of the things that we uh, will look at in a little bit more detail when we go into plate tectonics in module two is this idea of convection currents, of the fact that these plates, the lithospheric plates, are moving around on a surface that is uh, fluid, that's capable of flow, which means that the plates can move relative to one another, not necessarily all in the same direction, nor at the same speed. So the convection currents in the asthenosphere are is what is um, assumed to be responsible for the relative motion of these lithospheric plates. What about the composition? Well, there is some difference in the composition of the materials, the rocks and minerals that make up the crust and, oh, and or the lithosphere and those that make up the upper part of the mantle. Now, we're going to look at a few different um, groupings for minerals in rocks a little bit later in this topic, um, but you'll hear terms like felsic and mafic and ultramafic, and these are terms that are describing particular types of uh, elements primarily within different minerals as they combine together to form these complex uh, network crystals, and we'll look at those in a little bit more detail as we get further through this first topic. Uh, but most of the Earth's mantle are rocks that are regarded as silicates. So silicates is a, a network structure. It's actually a link between silicon and oxygen. And if you look at a periodic table, you'll notice that silicon sits below oxygen in the periodic table. And if you have any understanding of organic chemistry, you'll know that there's a huge range of compounds that are based on carbon. Carbon is that key central uh, atom about, uh, around which so many important um, organic or bio uh, molecules uh, are found. Now, silicon, silicon can do a similar sort of thing. So, you know, if you that's why one of the suggestions about alternate life forms is if it's not made of carbon, it's more likely to be made of silicon. One of the problems with silicon is it's a much heavier 
uh, element than carbon, carbon, and so that has some um, consequences around things like uh, gravity, center of gravity, and those sorts of things. But silicates or silicon dioxide is a great network covalent structure that has lots and lots of bonds in all sorts of directions. We know it's pretty hard. Um, simplest way to think about a silicate is something like quartz, the little grains that you find on the beach. Um, they're quite hard. They're not as hard as diamond, but they are quite hard. And, um, and they have this, this network structure. One of the differences in a lot of the chemistry associated with minerals compared to what you may have already looked at previously in, in year 10 chemistry, for example, is that we have um, a lot of the chemical substances that we look at are quite uh, simple in terms of the chemical formulas, even if you may not have thought they were. Um, but the um, elements that can be part of silicates that can combine together in crystals can be a little bit more complex in terms of the chemistry associated. So we'll try not to make the chemistry too difficult. At this stage, what we'll try and do is see if we can identify some different types of rocks uh, and minerals that might be present, or at least that might be indicative of different layers within the earth. Uh, and one of those really important ones is olivine, and this is this green, um, mineral that you can see here. Now, sometimes we have material that's actually moved to the surface from below, um, and xenoliths we've talked about previously as giving us a little bit of an idea of uh, rocks that have come from other places and therefore may have minerals that are not necessarily um, consistent or um, uh, indicative of uh, the particular place in which they are found. They might have come from somewhere else. So olivines, garnets, uh, pyroxenes are characteristic of the types of silicates that you find in rocks within the mantle. Um, magnesium oxide, another one. And also we do find some iron, aluminium, calcium, sodium, potassium. These are some of the elements that you may find in um, uh, smaller amounts in some of the um, minerals within the mantle. Obviously, iron's a particularly important one because it is uh, a key element in the core. It's the reason why the core is magnetic. Um, and also, iron being such a heavy atom uh, is one of the ones that would have sunk uh, down to the centre of the Earth as the Earth was uh, cooling and forming. Temperature is another factor that's worth looking at in terms of the asthenosphere. And you can kind of see that we have, as a rough trend, um, we have what we call a geothermal gradient, and that is that as you go down into the earth, you increase temperature. It's not perfectly linear, um, but it's roughly so. So we get a little bit of an idea about what's going on. Now, the fact that it's not perfectly linear is, is basically an indication that we don't have consistency either in terms of our composition um, or in terms of our distribution. So there are places where the temperature rises a little more quickly and other places where it rises a little less quickly. Generally speaking, though, you're talking about a range of temperatures between about 1,000 degrees, which is, you know, the sort of temperatures that you might expect to, around volcanic activity uh, or a bit higher right down to uh, 3,700 degrees, closer to the boundary between the mantle and the core. So with the asthenosphere sitting in the top section of the um, mantle, just below the lithosphere, it's not going to reach quite those uh, high temperatures that we would find further down in the mantle, uh, but you can see here probably around about the 1,500 uh, sort of mark that we're, we're expecting to find um, in the asthenosphere. And it's not just heat that increases as we um, go further into the depths of the earth, we also find pressure. And hopefully those two things make sense to you and are um, what you would expect. And these together are part of this geothermal gradient, this change that's occurring as we move through the layers of the Earth. So a little bit of a summary. We'll have a look and pull some of these next two out in class in a little bit more detail. But just to give you an overall summary so you can kind of start to get a little bit of an idea, these heavy metals that are, are linked to the Earth's magnetism are the characteristic um, elements that we would find in the core because they're associated with magnetic fields. In the mantle, we've got these, as I mentioned before, ultramafic um, 
minerals that are present in the lower parts of the mantle, the remainder of the upper mantle and all of the lower mantle, and also the fact that we've, our temperatures are getting much, much higher as we plunge further into the depths of the mantle, and also the fact that we've got some slight changes occurring. Of course, as uh, we measure things like the passage of uh, primary and secondary waves um, using our uh, seismic technologies. So just a quick overview here to give you a little bit of an idea. And I think these sorts of tables, the reason I put this here is because I think tables are a great way of summarizing information. If you're trying to put together some of the material from the last couple of um, videos, then this is a nice way of sort of summarizing all that information, giving it to you at a glance and helping you to memorize these um, key features. The last thing that's worth talking about is that because the mantle is so deep, uh, there's been a lot of arguments over what's happening with the mantle. One of the things that's interesting when we look at the mantle is this um, idea of something called the D double prime. So it's basically another discontinuity. So we talked about the moho in one of the previous videos where there's a discontinuity. There seems to be a, a, a sudden change in the properties of the waves, for example, as the, as the seismic waves move from one part of the uh, Earth to another. And these kind of sudden shifts or changes do tell us something about a boundary event, some, some change uh, in the refractive index of the material or the properties of the material that means that it's, it's affecting the waves in such a way that it changes something about them. It, it refracts them or it, or it diffracts them, changes their direction, moves them around. So these are the sorts of things that we're always looking for because they give us little bits of information. Some of the ideas about the mantle that maybe it's subducted slabs of lithosphere, so where there's parts of the earth where the, the crust or material itself has started to move back down, that that material actually goes in and incorporates itself as these little slabs settling into the mantle. Maybe the, the lower mantle is not moving at all. It's, it's completely stationary. No heat transfers, no convection currents. That's another idea. Um, I've talked a little bit about the, the um, D double prime. And one of the other little ideas is, I guess, what we might call the lava lamp theory, which is um, geologists and seismologists occasionally have detected these areas of huge amounts of melts, kind of little plumes that are rising up in certain regions that are associated with these D double primes. And maybe they're, they're kind of coming from the even hotter outer core below, because they often do seem to have iron associated with them and just a sort of little lumps come up in a lava lamp towards the top of the lamp and you see the material swirling that maybe that's a model that we can use to understand maybe some of what might be happening in the lower mantle or at least overall in the mantle. So there's a few different ideas. What we might do is have a bit of a look in class at a couple of these different ideas and see if we can find some evidence to support them. But that's something that we'll do in class. Thanks for watching.